Um, but welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar um, titled What You Need to Know to Get the Most Out of Your Healthcare Visit. My name is Sarah Miller and I am our Director of Partnerships here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and I'm very excited to be the facilitator for today's webinar. So I do wanna go ahead and jump into a few housekeeping items. Um, so I will start by going through the objectives. Um, so the first objective is understand the importance of being part of the care team. The second is discuss challenges associated with optimizing clinical visits. The third, describe attributes of a successful clinical visit. And then last but not least, examine actionable steps for care team involvement and care coordination. Um, this webinar has been approved for one BCPA credit. Um, please note that the, B, that the BCPA CE credit only applies for those who are joining today's live webinar. Um, if you have any questions about this CE, um, it will take about five to seven days to process. Um, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to email education at patientsafetymovement.org. Um, one other housekeeping item that I do want to note, um, this discussion will be about 45 minutes long with 15 minutes at the end for a Q&A session. Um, if anybody has a question for our fellow panelists, um, we do have a Q&A box at the very bottom right-hand corner of the Zoom link. Um, so please pop your questions in there to ensure that everyone um, on our side will receive them and we can answer those appropriately. Um, and then we do have a chat box on the left-hand side here. Um, so if you have any general comments that you want to share with our fellow attendees um, and our panelists, please pop those in there. Um, but just, I, I wanna reiterate the importance, questions for our panelists go in the Q&A and any general comments for our panelists and other attendees will go in the chat feature. Another housekeeping item is we do have um, a fun interactive polling feature for today's presentation. Um, it is called Slido. Um, you'll see here that um, there is a QR code that you can scan um, that will take you directly to the link, or you can join at slido.com and type in pound 439438. Um, again, um, the slides will be up shortly for those questions, um, but I would encourage you all to please take part in this um, and have um, a fun interactive discussion with us. So with that said, I'm really excited to um, kind of share the light with Marilyn Whitley, and um, she is today's moderator for our panel. So um, Marilyn, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Marilyn Whitley, and I am been a nurse by trade for over 25 years, and I am an independent patient advocate. I uh, live in North Carolina and mostly do uh, a fair bit of independent patient advocate work here. Uh, and has been in healthcare for, for a very long time. So this topic of what you need to know is very dear to my heart, as I would say. I do this every day with clients as an independent patient advocate and makes such a big difference to the outcome. So um, we are getting ready to get started today to talk about that. And I've I'm just going to turn it over to each of the panelists to introduce themselves, and um, we'll just go in order. Karen, if you want to start first, that would be great. Thank you, Marilyn. I'm Karen Curtis, um, also a board-certified patient advocate, though not in private practice. I founded and now lead the Care Partner Project, which offers uh, a variety of checklists for quick uh, patient and family education for navigating and managing our very complex healthcare system. And Lois? Hi, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. I'm Lois Cameron. I'm Managing Director of a social enterprise in Scotland called Talking Maps, whose vision is to support people with communication difficulties to express their views. By background, I am a speech and language therapist. So I'm particularly interested in the interface uh, between uh, communication and how that impacts on healthcare interactions. Great, and then Dr. Moyo. Uh, to everyone, my name is Dingani Moyo. I'm an occupational medicine specialist. 
trained by the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland. I've been in the clinical management field for the past 25 years. And I've been involved quite extensively in terms of patient care. I'm also a university lecturer at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa, as well as the Midland State University. The greater part of my career really has been spent in uh, looking after patients and also advocating for patient safety within um, the healthcare services. Thank you. Well, it's great to have everybody here today. And we've got some great questions to start with, and we look forward to some of the comments and question and answers at the end as well. Um, and we'll get started today. We'd like each of our panelists to um, answer the questions from their level, um, their area of expertise. And um, we'll start with Lois today. Uh, and the first question is, uh, what does it mean to optimize clinical visits? And why is it essential that you're a part of your care team? Um, well, your health care visits are the sort of bedrock of being able to explore health issues. And if health, uh, if communication is a major issue, then you, that is going to be an ineffective visit. Um, and I think we need to remember that all of us uh, could potentially have a communication difficulty at some point in our lives. 20% of us will have a communication difficulty at some point of our lives. That might be caused through dementia, through stroke, through all sorts of things, learning disability. Um, and so it's really important that we remember it takes two to communicate um, and that the advantage of the fact that it takes two to communicate means that it's always possible to improve communication by, the, um, by one partner reaching over to use more creative or inclusive met met uh, methods of communication. So for me, communication is fundamental to good quality healthcare. And I'm already beginning to see the poll that it's a bit of a major problem. So um, that's, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, Lois. And yes, we've uh, posted our first Slido question uh, of today. And if uh, you know our audience could do the active poll, and the question is, I've experienced poor communication during my healthcare visit. Um, and so far we've had, it's looking, like you said, 100%. It is, um, Dr. Mayo, we'd love to hear some feedback from you on this question about optimizing a clinical visit. Okay, thank you very much. Um, in uh, the optimization of a clinical visit really determines the outcome of one's treatment and uh, ultimately also determines the prognosis of your medical condition. So optimizing a clinical visit basically refers to where the patient comes in and um, is consulted, are uh, giving uh, all their complaints with clarity in abundance, as well in a comprehensive and logical manner, and not under any duration, so as to enable the healthcare professional to be able to come to a diagnosis and ultimately influence the treatment. So mm -hmm. optimization um, of uh, that clinical visit makes and shows that um, the patient who have the optimum um, uh, service provided by the healthcare provider. Therefore, it has to be uh, ushered in a very clear, comprehensive, simple uh, articulation in order to give as much information to the healthcare provider as well. And being part of the healthcare team in that aspect ensures that this is not a one-sided um, activity where it's only the healthcare professional who is determining uh, the outcome of your treatment, but also as patients themselves, they are also part of the decision-making, also influenced by the nature in which they collaborate 
and also provide information to the healthcare provider. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maya. That is great information. Um, I love the part where you said about being clear, you know, and that kind of ties in what Lois had said about communication. Karen, um, if you could jump in here from, you know, your perspective, your expertise um, <clears throat> in the roles of the family, if you could answer that question, that would be great next. Well, all of the education that we've created is actually aimed at the family member care partners or the patient advocate that um, a patient may bring into their, onto their care team. And the reason for that is that patients usually, unless it's just a routine wellness visit, are, are really under duress. As Dr. Um, Moyo said, there's, there's, uh, the stakes can be very high. And in those instances, it's very hard for a patient to um, attend to all of the important details that are coming at them. Mm -hmm. um, and it, at, at that extra set of eyes and ears are critically important. And we have strategies of how that care partner can participate while still keeping the focus on the patient, because that's really what I think we're all about is that patient-centered focus where it's the patient's needs that, that drive everything. Um, but having that assistant um, can, can help in so many different ways of keeping track of information to review later on, whether it's in notes or recorded on an iPhone, which is you know, a, a very simple, valuable tool. Um, and that every patient then gets that extra layer of support post visit, even um, to make sure that the, you know, every word that the patient that the doctor communicates is memorialized and understood and can be acted upon. Karen, that that's just like great comments, and it, so that kind of ties into another question that I want to ask and Dr. Moyo if you'll jump in on this one this that would be great um firstly when we ask why are clinical visits not already optimized like where why do you think that is thank you very much there are, there are a number of factors uh, that lead um to failure to optimize the current clinical visits number one I think one of the major challenges really with both uh, with patients and even on the healthcare provider side is lack of preparation. If one is going to uh, be uh, going for a clinical visit, one major issue that currently hasn't been optimized is lack of preparation. How are you going to describe your symptoms or your issues in terms in a chronological and simple manner? I think uh, oftentimes patients, because they are overly in pain, they end up not being able to clearly prepare so as to define and um, set forth to their healthcare providers their major problems. Secondly, we have seen from my experience, I've realized that at times patients overly summarize their complaints to the point that um, the healthcare provider is to be poking in to try and elicit information which ideally shouldn't be the case. Information must be presented in abundance in clear uh, in certain terms and with, and that takes preparation from the uh, patient side, which apparently in often, in most cases is not the case. And the other issue that um, um, uh, is not uh, commonly found amongst uh, clinical visits is that at times the patient and the healthcare provider, they fail to establish a rapport so that it's a collaborative, discursive uh, interaction without any fear or any uncertainties where all the necessary information that is uh, required for making a diagnosis and coming up with a treatment plan is clearly spelled out. So, Key issues, lack of preparation, overly summarized complaints, lack of rapport, both on either side, the patient and also the healthcare providers. 
I think those are the, some of the major issues uh, which have led to the sub-optimization of these clinical visits. Thank you. Dr. Ma, that is, oh, sorry, Karen. Would you like to jump in? Just to add one more point, I, I agree with everything that uh, Dr. Moyo says, and um, and this kind of goes hand in hand with Lois's comment too, when you have people who are impaired in some way and able to communicate, I think it's very important to know when setting up the appointment, how much time do you actually have? You know, is it a seven minute visit? Is it a 15 minute is it, is it visit or, or do you have the luxury of 30 to 45 minutes? And so that, that preparation informed by the amount of time you actually have can help inform the preparation uh, for that visit. And that's a really good point, Karen. And most of the time in my experience, that's not volunteered to the patient, correct? You, you kind of have to ask. Yeah. Uh, because it's not always unless it's a first time and a you know a bigger concern it may be brought up in the beginning but not typically um lois would you like to jump in here you know it seems like the whole communication thing is uh kind of floating around i'm sure you would have some great comments to put in at this point well i do think time is a major issue and i think a being explicit, I think that would be a really helpful starting point. Uh, and that's often not explicit. You have to kind of guess at it. But I think to follow on, uh, on from Dr. Meyer's point about rapport, I think that is a fundamental building block. Um, and about six years, we did a study with people with had, who had communication difficulties on their experience of healthcare action, uh, interactions. And actually 75% great healthcare interactions. So that's 75% where it was working well. So you might think that's a good news story, but actually that means it's not working well for 25%. So one in four, it's not working well. And when you, take that with what Dr. Moya was saying earlier about that that's a fundamental uh, plank to um, effective health care, you, you've got to really question that. And when we dug down on that, actually a lot of that was to do with um, health care staff's attitudes or fear of communicating with some differently and I think we need to create a culture where you can actually discuss some of those things so that in a way that you can name the problem to address the problem uh, because it's great for so many people but that's still a significant number for mm -hmm. whom they didn't feel the communication was going well and for whom you know health is then threatened because they haven't maximized their visits. And then sometimes, Lois, it, it seems to be that, you know, it also comes up that the relationship between the provider and the patient and the family are not always a good fit. You, you know, what do you um, see in your practice about that? Like, what would you recommend if, if they said, we feel like we don't have a great relationship or it's maybe not a good fit? Could you tell us a little bit about that? I think there needs to be much more openness about that. Uh, and that's probably on both sides too, so that you can actually um, address that. So what what is the problem with the good fit? Is it that somebody's not looking at the person when they're communicating? Is it maybe that they do need to think, well, actually you'd get on better with somebody else. Um, but at the moment that's, that's not really talked about or it's very difficult to do um, without causing a major problem to actually shift um, provider. Um, and I, I just think we need to be more open about it, but in a kind of um, way that's supportive to the individuals, not in a way that's confrontational. Mm -hmm. Dr. Moyo, do you have anything to add to that? I know that kind of um, puts you in there from a provider perspective, but I would imagine that this probably happened in in your practice as well sometimes, sometimes things are you know may not be a good fit quite true 
Yeah, oftentimes um, you find that uh, patients, they, they lose that precious or golden moment in terms of articulating uh, their issues. And then we end up with repeated visits, clinical visits, which are really unnecessary because they would have been caused by the initial um, uh, contact with the healthcare provider where information was never clearly spelled out. And um, it is my uh, encouragement to both patients and um, health, uh, health providers to ensure that there is clarity at, a, at, a, at any point in time when we, uh, we during a clinical consultation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I like that golden moment. That's really, you know, because when you're when you're in that relationship, you know, as a provider, that's really, really important for sure. Um, <clears throat> moving to the next question I, we'd like to ask today is, um, and we'll start with you on this one, Lois. What are the different challenges for different groups of patients and family members? Um, well, I, I'm going to focus on, on people with communication difficulties. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely think that communication is not seen enough as a patient safety issue um, and that we need to actually acknowledge um, that that is a patient safety um, issue. So, for example, in my profession in speech and language therapy, swallowing is often seen as a patient safety issue, but communications not seen and isn't given the same degree of attention. And for me, that is absolutely um, wrong because I think if you do not get the communication right, Dr. Moyers highlighted that, you do not get the treatment right. And that can either cause erroneous treatment, long-term suffering, and, and, up, and at its danger point, um, death. If you look at um, serious case reviews um, of when things have gone wrong, nearly always in every single one, there's some communication issue there. So we have to start naming communication as a patient safety issue and addressing it as a patient safety issue. That is a, yeah, a fantastic, you know, a great point, Lois, like a patient safety issue for communication. Um, Karen, would you like to jump in here because I know this is dear to you and your, um, you know, where you've done your work over the years in the patient safety world. Um, you know, I feel like you probably have a lot to bring to this question as well. Well, I, I think I'd like to propose something kind of radical. And that is that we don't look at um, doctor visits or doctor appointments it, in, in, in quite that way. Um, we've been talking about rapport. It takes time to build rapport. And in the reality of our healthcare system, time is golden. What I propose is that we look at these as meetings where the patient comes prepared with, yes, their list of concerns and complaints and pains and so forth and, and summaries of, their, of their, their histories, but that they come and first and foremost, what are their objectives? So this is a meeting. This is, a, this is um, where the, the patient leads by stating, what are my objectives? I want to walk out of here with X, Y, and Z, answered, resolved, next steps, and flow from there so that the satisfaction with the doctor's appointment or visit or meeting flows from, I've been heard because my objectives are leading this discussion. And that um, this can all be done, um, hopefully very efficiently, uh, you know, if, if the doctor feels respected for their time, because they know they don't have to guess, it flows from very clear communication coming from the patient themselves about themselves. So that's, in an ideal world, I'd like to sort of reframe it as 
we are peers meeting about solving the problem together led by these objectives. Mm -hmm. I, I think that is, you know, that kind of ties together what all of you have said, right? That um, you can't be successful in any meeting without two partners, whether it's the communication piece or the preparation piece and all of those um, together make it, you know, much more successful. Um, at the end of the day. Um, and I think, Sarah, were we going to move into another Slido question shortly? Or um, I think I'm we're happy. getting. I'm happy to pull it up. I think we're moving into, I'm just looking at my little um, notes here. As we will start on, we've got another um, a question kind of tying, I guess, trying to tie everything in um, together today. And I, and I think this will take probably a little bit from everybody, but we'd love to hear from each panelist if they could, you know, prioritize two or three things, like tell our audience two or three things that would really um, make a difference to optimizing, you know, your clinical visit. So what can patients and families do before they go for their clinical visit? And like I said, if each of you could kind of summarize maybe two to three things while we're running um, this little poll, and then we'll kind of comment on that as we get in through. So I feel like I've started with you most of the day, Lois. How about you want, you want to start with this um, last question that we've <clears throat> which will probably take a little bit, but um, what family members can do to prepare, you know, for the best optimization of their clinical visit? Not me, Marilyn. Yes, ma'am. You look, Miss Lois. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I think my internet dropped out there. Um, uh, well, we've talked about um, preparation and I think that is key. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, I come, uh, uh, you know, we've developed uh, a communication tool called Talking Mats that allows people to reflect on their health. And I think using something like that, that allows them to actually detail what are the key issues so that actually you can get, you know, because we've, we, we recognize that time is precious, but I really liked Karen's idea too of accepting that this is a meeting where both sides come together and that if people have clarity around their health needs and have begun to thought things through, that will make it easier for the health provider or it may also identify those things that they need more information about because you can't make a decision until you've got that information. So it's also about being clear about what are the questions you want answered um, because it's all about balancing those things up so that you can work, for, uh, you can work out a way forward. Mm -hmm. And that that is you know in summary Lois those are great points when we we can look at our little question we just asked in the active poll what do you <clears throat> excuse me what do you do to improve communication during your healthcare visit and most people have said they have pen and paper available um, you know to supplement and and sixty percent said I bring a loved one with me to be an advocate or an interpreter. Um, which is, you know, I think for us as panelists, that's no surprise. That's the most common um, that we tell people. And as an independent patient advocate, I tell people all the time as a nurse, either, you know, family, friends that, you know, that writing things down and bringing it or bringing someone with you, especially when it's a, a hard time. So Karen, I think, you know, if you want to go next, we'd love to hear your thoughts for preparation, you know, what do you think would be two or three tips, you know, the, the most important things to optimize clinical visits? Two or three things. It's hard to, to winnow that. <laughs> I know. 
uh, and, and as in life, you know, preparation is uh, is is uh, really leads to a lot of success. So I would say beforehand, you know, setting up the appointment and understanding, you know, the time that you have. If you're accompanying, if you're as a family member or accompanying a loved one who is um, has some. Um, communication challenges or developmental challenges, try to get that first appointment in the morning so you're not in the waiting room or the first appointment after lunch. That's just a very practical tip because it's hard for somebody, um, for example, if you, you know, we have something like 40 to 60% of, of, of family members are now acting as, as caregivers to loved ones with challenges and, um, you know, their time is, is valuable too. So to, to be able to get in and not have to deal with waiting rooms and, and to call in advance, the doctor running on time, um, just simple things like that. And then of course, bringing um, uh, your, your list of concerns, all of your medication records, you know, ma making sure that you're, that you're checking the, that electronic portal regularly to make sure that it's accurate and up to date. If it's not, just bring a list of the corrections that you need to have happen. Fill out all of the electronic, usually doctors now are giving you all the forms to fill out in advance. So you don't have to sit there with their clipboards anymore. Um, get that done. So those are just a, a few things quickly, more than three, sorry. <laughs> It was, but those are great, Karen. And the theme for me when I listen to you say that is all about being proactive, right? It's all about oh, yeah. Yeah. being that, um, which is so good. And it's taking ownership for your, you know, your healthcare and, and moving in there. Um, Dr. Moyle, you've brought so much insight to us today from a provider perspective. You know, ideally, if you could have um, give your, your patients, your families, two to three good tips, you know, things that would really benefit their provider visit. What would those be for you? Number one, when you visit your provider, always remember that you will never be taken by surprise in terms of questions. The healthcare provider will always ask you, what is the problem? When did this start? What else is associated with your problem? What medications are you on? What investigations have been done? So those things you should go to your health service provider expecting those questions and you must have answers. I think Louise has also just mentioned that uh, you need to know about your medication history and record. You can list those medications down, the different tests that have been done. So that's number one. Number two, before you go to the health service provider, always make sure that by the time you come out of that consultation room, you fully understand what your medical condition or health condition is fully, and what are the medications or the treatment plan, and also the prognosis of your condition. Oftentimes, people come out of a health uh, provider's office without really being very clear about what is their condition, what medication are they taking? Is this lifelong or not? Make sure before you even leave for consultation, you will make sure that uh, those questions you will ask your health service provider, so that by the time you are very quite, you are very clear about um, those are the, your your condition. I think those are the, the key issues that I would uh, uh, ask uh, patients to bear in mind. That is, you know, those are great points and and as you said the last thing about knowing your diagnosis you know sometimes it's hard for providers to even pinpoint one particular you know or they may not have a definitive when um individuals leave the office and sometimes that leaves them a little uncertain do you have any suggestions for how you know, it sounds like when you were saying your tips, like being able to summary, summarize or tell your provider back what you have discussed, right, would be helpful in you understanding. Is there anything else when it's a, you know, sometimes a confusion or a miss, not a full diagnosis, you're still kind of 
um, looking at or you have other tests to do, is there something else that you would suggest that patients and family do um, to help them understand better? Right. Um, maybe if you're still uh, on my side, one uh, another important issue is uh, to ensure that um, patients or clients will always volunteer the, all the truth to the health service care provider. We've got uh, oftentimes where we have uh, clients who, who do shopping of health care providers, but when they come to our clinic office, they never volunteer that information. It's always hidden uh, without really disclosing that you have visited so many health care practitioners, and this is the advice that they have been doing, that they have been giving you. So when uh, during um, consultation, ensure that you disclose everything that has happened uh, with regards to your condition, with regards to your treatments and investigations. Uh, even also, we discourage uh, health care provider shopping where you would really want to get uh, a diagnosis or rather a preferred diagnosis. Rather, I think just be objective, volunteer all the information to the healthcare provider, and then they will string that together uh, for your own good in terms of diagnosis, treatment, uh, and follow-up. Mm -hmm. Those are some, some great points. And I love the way you emphasize being truthful. Um, you know, one of the things I often say to our clients is, you know, our providers are only as good as the information they're giving, and they sometimes don't know what they, you know, don't know if they've not been told. So um, that's a really, really good point. And, and I think that is very um, important as well. Karen or Lois, do you guys have anything else to add to that? I, you know, I think he, some of that works into trust too, I'm sure, but I didn't know if you, either one of you had any um, points you'd like to bring up at this point? Just that at the end of the day, trust is always going to be uh, what underlines good communication. And we will only, you know, that's, we will only communicate as much as we feel safe and trusting with the other person. So that's important on both sides of the dynamic, mm -hmm. that there is trust. How about you, Karen? Do anything? This has been a terrific discussion and, and, you know, getting the perspective of a physician is rounds out the picture, I think, for all of us and for Lois to bring up something that about, you know, very real practical considerations in communication um, that are, have, you know, potential limitations. And I think my main takeaway from this discussion is that we at the Care Partner Project will develop a, a, a toolkit. So we will amass, you know, um, you know, checklists based on this, thank you very much to the patient safety movement for bringing us together. We will bring this work forward. You won't have to take notes here because we'll put it all on the Care Partner Project um, website for uh, tools for patients and family members to be prepared and to do their part to um, fully communicate um, openly and honestly with their physicians. And we'll, we'll provide all of that. So look for that. Put your um, email address in the chat box if you'd like for us to send it to you directly or check in with the Care Partner Project. But this has been a very, very important uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and, and you know, from an as someone that works as an independent patient advocate, so I work closely in the community with, with patients and families. Um, you know, we, we do do a lot of prep work with our clients, you know, and our patients' families before visits um, so that they can get the most out of it. That And that is a very common theme. So, you know, as I said in the beginning, that's dear to me because it is, um, but having something all put together with all the pieces in there, you know, like Louis, you had said about communication and then Dr. Moyle talked about preparation and being truthful and, and all those, those are just so important to the keys to being successful, you know, and getting the information you need. So I think we are getting, um, for me, close to
the question. Do we have any questions in our question, um, Sarah, from our group? Or yeah, so with <clears throat> excuse me, with about fifteen minutes left, I do want to kind of kickstart the Q and A session, Marilyn. I'm happy to kind of filter through um, the questions that have come through. But thank you all for you know having. It looks like there have been some great conversations going on through the chat. But the first question that's come through. Um, is from an anonymous attendee. And the question is, does the panel agree that communication requires only two people? Does a second listener have a role in improving effective communication? Does anyone um, want to start off by answering that? Um, that might have come when I talked about the, the, the communication always involves two people. It can, of course, involve more than two people, but is a dynamic interaction so at least needs uh face-to-face -face communication needs at least two people um and i mean i think that is one of the advantages of it because as i said um the one person can bridge across to support another person's communication so you almost don't know what you don't know if you don't put the supports in you can't see how you can help that person to communicate more effectively. Uh, and yes, of course, um, particularly when you're in a stressful situation or you're having to process information, having another pair of ears there to actually take in what is said and to repeat that back can be really, really useful. Um, I think what's key is, though, that the focus is on the person with the health issue and the other person is there to support and that everybody understands that dynamic so that the other person doesn't take over I think is what I'm trying to say they're there in a support in a supporting role mm -hmm. that's my answer don't know what Karen and Dr Moyo think I completely concur with what you've just said absolutely correct Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Um, well, the next question that we have, um, I do want to start with you, Dr. Moyo, but the question is, are providers open to having visits recorded? And is there any time when this is not allowed? That's a difficult question, <laughs> so to speak. But uh, look, it all depends um, with the healthcare providers in terms of those recordings, whether um, the, 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 the healthcare provider is comfortable with that and also in compliance with the regulatory provisions that guide um, the, um, the practice of medicine or nursing in that particular aspect. So really there is no one size fits all. It has to be contextual, uh, but likely driven um, from, from the understanding of the healthcare provider and also the ethical uh, provisions within the profession, as well as the regulatory provisions in that particular state. Such things will vary, uh, especially from country to country or from region to region. So it depends on the preference of the healthcare provider. But one thing that I must say is that um, a patient ideally is got to right of access uh, in terms of their health conditions. They need to know fully about what is happening about them, what is being planned, or nothing really should be done without a patient's full understanding in, in clear terms. But uh, specifically in terms of um, recording those sessions, really, I, I wouldn't give you a very um, one size fits all answer, but just to say, is contextual or circumstantial uh, depending on where it uh, is being practiced. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moya. Um, the next question that we have, I'll, I'll read through it a little bit. So it says, if we have met with a provider and as a result need to go to another specialized individual, is it a requirement if we ask to get written records to ensure that what's in the record is correct? That's perfectly fine. Ideally, when you are moving from one uh, health provider to the other, records, both from who has been treating you all this far, 
uh, are always required such that um, it makes life easier even for the attending physician whom you have been referred to um, in order to fully understand because some of the information or some of the results will be in medical jargon that the client at times may not fully understand. And therefore there is need uh, normally referral letters from one service provider to the other are ideal. Although in some cases, you'll find that a person will move from one healthcare provider even uh, behind their back and um, go to the next service provider. The next service provider who is not like they will turn them uh, away, but it suffices to say, it's always ideal to have a referral from one practitioner to the other to so as to clearly um, facilitate the patient care even to at a higher specialist level. Mm -hmm. Great, thank, thank you, Dr. Moya. Um, it looks like we have one more question um, mm -hmm. and I'd love to get everybody's thoughts on this one. Um, but the question is, can the panelists comment on the pros and cons of using a family member versus an independent advocate to support the patient as the family member may have their own agenda? Marilyn, do you wanna start? That is, um you know, uh, that's a, a great question. And there's not one simple answer, I would say that, uh, but what I would comment on is that, again, it depends on the patient and the family member. I always think, you know, someone that knows the patient the best is, is the best person to be with them. Of course, knowing them inside and out, family know them very, very well an independent patient advocate would know the medical side and some other pieces as well. Um, but I would say the biggest point in that is that the focus has to be on that person. So if it's family they look at, but they're not sure that family would be, um, you know, totally objective, family would be totally understanding just being in that listening mode. Cause of course, as patient advocates, most of the time we do listen. Um, we do summarize at the end you know, that kind of a, a, a role we take, or that's what the way I do in practice. So I think it would be a good discussion to have with somebody if you wondered if your family member would not, you know, totally understand. So when we talk to people and when I do like education information and that, I always tell our, you know, audience that they could easily have a family member that could be their advocate, right? Like a patient advocate. But again, it, it focuses in on that. Do they have their best interests and are they, you know, going to leave that patient to be the center of the conversation and the meeting? I like the meeting, Karen. Totally about the meeting today. <laughs> Karen, did you have any comments? Questions? You know, I agree with Marilyn um, because we try to frame that issue gently at the Care Partner Project where uh, like one, one line that we have in our um, childbirth um, checklist is that if, you know, we spell it out, if, if you don't think that you can be, you know, objective, put the the mom to be needs first, you know, really basically suspend your, you know, your yourself, um, then maybe the best care partner you can be is to find someone else to fill that role, whether it's a professional or, you know, a, a best friend, um, because it, it is tough, even though, uh, you know, family members, you know, we, we all have families, we all have opinions. <laughs> So, so being able to suspend that is kind of a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's really, um, a, it's a very good point. Um, on the other hand, sometimes, you know, family members, you know, can read their loved one in a way that nobody else can. And so they can kind of fill in. Um, it's, it's, it, 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 it's just something that needs to be aired. I think transparency and a good discussion is the best start for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and this just brings me to another point when you said that, Karen, I actually, I can give you an example of a, a client that I do have, and I support 
the daughter more than I, you know, in that she is her mom's best advocate. And nearly every conversation we have, somewhere in there, I always say, you know your mom better than anybody. Um, so that is, you know, again, you know, for us, we kind of play the situation because in this situation, that daughter just needs a little bit of coaching from us as patient advocates for her to be her mom's best advocate. So um, I think it sometimes is a little bit different in each situation, but but that is another, you know, thought. I think it is, it is different in each situation and it is a case by case. Mm -hmm. um, uh, scenario but I really liked Marilyn your comment there that you were coaching the family member or supporting the family member because sometimes it becomes an either or and actually that's not particularly helpful because if you're a family member taking on that role then having some sort of coaching or mentoring to allow you to be reflective and think about your own agendas and think about how to put your loved one's views across is really, really helpful. So mm -hmm. it's not an either or either. Um, and family members, if they're in that role, need some active support because it's not an easy role. Mm -mm. It's really not. And, and, you know, for me, we always say, you know, I'm being a great patient advocate if I can work myself out of a job. <laughs> like if I can get with individuals and families and support them and empower them to be able to make good decisions and feel good about what they're doing, then that is, you know, they don't really need me as much anymore. And those are the great situations and the great, you know, cases that we get to work on. I think to where somebody's got a communication difficulty, it's often the family member that can interpret the speech much more quickly and effectively than a non-familiar speaker to but mm -hmm. I, I i like the idea of them being supported mm -hmm. it's really helpful good well i don't <clears throat> excuse me i don't see any other questions that have come through um but if anyone that is here for the live webinar if you guys have any other questions that you'd like our panelists to answer. I will give it about a minute for you guys to pop them in there. Otherwise, we'll ensure that um, if you want to email us, we can get those questions answered and send those back to you. Mm -hmm. um, but Marilyn, is there anything else that you'd like to say before I close this out? I don't, I think the last question, did someone ask about, um, a, a, you know, which type of patient advocate to get if you were getting, it seemed like I was reading the question, I'm not sure, but, um, yeah, but there, there was there something was, there, I think. Yeah, there's some activity um, in the chat about that as well. Uh -huh. So, you know, and Karen, um, I know that you know a lot. I mean, Karen and I are board certified patient advocates and we are nationally, internationally sort of, um, you know, recognized in that. And for me, and I'm sure Karen would say, we, we always recommend if you're going to get somebody, I would recommend that you get someone that's board certified. Um, you know, from an ethical, they, they've done their um, homework, they've, you know, they've tested, they're certified, but there's a lot of great, you know, advocates that are out there and there's different avenues. We always tell people to start in that and then you, you know, depending on the type of person you are, whether you want someone who's medically licensed along with that board certification to support um, or depending on your situation. Karen, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Because I know that you have a lot, you've been doing this longer than me, even as a, um, it, from the, and knowing the board certified patient advocates and, and who we, you know, have in the United States and Canada, what your thoughts are. Well, I, the only thing that I would add to what you just said is that if somebody is medically, there are a lot of nurses who go into advocacy, well, like you did, um, but part of the advocacy role is not delivering care or actually mm -hmm. even making any recommendations based on medical knowledge. It's all about helping people to, to get to the right information, the right resources to make an informed decision on their own. 
Um, and that's really what, you know, um, advocates are just wired into collecting and organizing and helping people understand all of the pieces of information um, that are out there because it's 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 very it's very we have complicated systems no matter where in the world you are mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's the quarterback really <laughs> that the advocate does but ultimately it falls on the patient to make their own decisions based mm -hmm. on what fits for them but we you can't look to an rn patient advocate for any you know sort of advice that a, that a physician would give yeah Mm -hmm. so. And somebody in the chat says, can the advocates get involved in incorrect billing issues? Yes, we see that a lot. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Probably yeah, half yeah. of our practice is that. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the last question that we had here, it's more of a statement, but um, they said, Dr. Moya stated that the provider should share written information with the patient. I wonder if that needs to be translated for the patient to clarify medical terms. Oh, I think that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Dr. Moyle, do you want to comment on that? I didn't get you quite clearly in terms of the, the patients having sight of the medical records. Um, is it what you say? Yeah, so um, I'll reread it. It says, Dr. Moyo stated that the provider should share written information with the patient. I wonder if that needs to be translated for the patient to clarify medical terms. Yeah, ideally, um, the, 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 the information, like for instance, every medical record that relates to a patient is their information. And um, ideally, they need to be able to understand, especially where um, letters are written in terms of medical information, either to employers or even to the other doctors. Uh, or even the, 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 the full record in general, uh, patients are supposed to have access, at least um, from my experience and where I practice, the, a patient should have access to their medical records. And uh, even if there's medical jargon, et cetera, it needs to be explained to them uh, in simple terms so that they fully understand because it's information about them and they need to understand what's happening. Because this is particularly important where that information is to be transmitted from one doctor or one healthcare provider to the other. And we've often seen these things even in, in work situations where a medical re uh, report is written to an employer and um, the standard drill is to make sure that the, 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 the patient must see that record and must also agree with the record that is being said about themselves before it's transmitted so that there is clarity and um, uh, good uh, harmonious um, uh, relationship between the health service provider and the patient themselves. Can, can I also just say that I've popped into the chat and signposted uh, uh, a new organization called Card Medic, who were formed really during the pandemic when they realized that uh, particularly patients weren't understanding with everything in PPE and all the communication problems. So they've set up this app that basically allows easy read accessible health information about the major conditions to be part of the app. So I've just point, pop, uh, popped the link in there in case anybody's interested in it. But I think it's a great initiative because I think getting fast easy read information is a challenge and I'm glad that somebody's trying to tackle that. Great, thank you, Lois. Um, well, we are right at the top of the hour, so um, I'm happy to kind of close this out. I did wanna say thank you to everyone that's joined live today. Um, I hope you found value in today's discussion and thank you for um, participating in the interactive poll. Um, thank you so, so much um, to all of our panelists. And um, this was a lovely discussion and I hope everybody found value. In this as well. Um, if you, again, just want to reiterate a couple of housekeeping items. If you did join late, um, this webinar was approved for one VCPA credit for CE hours. Um, please email education at patientsafetymovement.org if you have any questions, but just wanted to note that this might take about five to seven days to process. Um, but again, if you join late, um, feel free to email us if you have any questions. 
Um, and then last but not least, here at the Patient Safety Movement, we do strive to present the highest level of you know, quality educational content to you all free of charge. Um, as a nonprofit, we do rely on donations from individuals. So we do kindly ask you to consider donating so that we can continue um, to kind of ramp up our educational programs and do what we can to support you all. Um, so if you have any questions, again, please email us or visit our website for more information. Um, but again, thank you all so much. Um, this webinar will be, has been recorded and will be posted on our website shortly. Thank you.